Hello and welcome to the first lecture for this week. We're talking about the ethics of voting. Today we're going to cover the first article that I had you read. This is Jason Brennan's Polluting the Polls When Citizens Should Not Vote. Instead of making one long lecture um, covering both of the articles, I'm going to be doing two separate lectures, um, shorter lectures. Um, at the end of the second one, I will connect them more directly. Um, I hope to have that lecture up tomorrow or at the very latest on Wednesday. I will have some discussion questions about Brennan up today. I'll be putting additional discussion questions up um, as soon as I get that second lecture up. Um, but feel free to go ahead and start discussing. Just make sure you come back so you can engage in all of the conversations that you want to be engaging in. Okay, so like I said, today we're going to be talking about Jason Brennan's argument on when citizens should not vote. So what is Brennan talking about in this argument? I want to start by making clear um, that he is not trying to change any laws. He's specifically talking about morality. So we can talk about when we have a legal right to do something versus when something is morally right to do. So um, what Brennan is arguing is not that we should take away anyone's right to vote. Instead, he's trying to argue that there might be instances where voting isn't morally right. So um, I just want to make sure I get this clear to avoid any confusion in the discussion or on future exam questions that Brennan is not um, advocating for limiting um, who is legally allowed to vote. He's only suggesting that there might be instances when exercising that right to vote might not be the morally appropriate thing to do. So. With that in mind, we can um, go to the question that he's asking in this argument, which is what duties do we have when it comes to voting? Living in a liberal democracy, um, liberal in the classical sense, not in like the contemporary left of center. Um, this just means like... Uh, it, it's unimportant. Just ignore that. Living in a democracy, um, what duties do we have to ensure we're being good citizens? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out Brennan's argument. Um, we're going to go through the different um, parts of the argument and different implications of the argument. And then we're going to end with some objections. Um, we're also going to set up where Nico Kolodny's article, um, How People Vote, plays in. Um, I want to mention really quick that this argument um, is part of a bigger project that Brennan is working on. Um, it's a book called Against Democracy that Jason Brennan um, is talking about. He's famously a libertarian. Um, so yeah, anyway. Um, and Nico Kolodny is going to be talking about that book, but the argument in that book that Kolodny is talking about is the argument he's presenting here. So don't let that confuse you when you read that article. Okay, so Brennan's argument is as follows. He says, first, as a first premise, one has an obligation not to engage in collectively harmful activities when refraining from such activities does not impose significant personal costs. Second premise, voting badly is to engage in a collectively harmful activity while abstaining from voting imposes low personal costs. This gets him to the conclusion, therefore, one should not vote badly. Um, he compares this to parenthood. He says we have a similar view of parenthood. He thinks we don't have an obligation to be a parent or to not be a parent, but if we do decide to become a parent, we have a duty not to be a bad parent. Um, he's going to argue similarly that we don't have an obligation um, to vote, but if we do decide to vote, uh, then we have an obligation not to vote badly. 
he is not arguing that we have no obligations regarding voting. He is not arguing that we are obligated to vote, but any vote is acceptable. Um, and he is not arguing that we must vote well. We're going to get to this later. Um, so Brennan is arguing that we ought to not vote badly, but this does not entail that we ought to vote well. Okay, so before we can truly understand his argument, we have to understand what he means by voting badly. Um, as a first pass, um, he says, well, maybe voting badly um, is just voting for harmful or unjust policies or for candidates likely to enact harmful or unjust policies. He thinks that this can't be what we mean by voting badly because he thinks that there might be instances where voting for harmful or unjust policies or for candidates who are likely to enact harmful or unjust policies are justified. Um, an example of this would be if there is a policy that all of the experts seem to agree will bring about good consequences or will ultimately benefit the nation, um, then voters might be justified in voting for this policy even if it winds up being harmful in the end. Um, similarly, if we're left with two really bad options, we might be justified in voting for a candidate who's likely to enact harmful or unjust policies when they're the lesser of two evils. So this gets him to his second pass and what he winds up um, sticking with, that voting badly is when a citizen votes without sufficient reason for harmful or unjust policies or for candidates that are likely to enact harmful or unjust policies. Um, in this way, you might think that this makes his argument circular, um, but it doesn't because he thinks that um, you might be able to justify this um, under certain circumstances or that individuals voting might not. Um, sorry, I completely lost my train of thought there. Anyway, um, so we can look at who our likely presidential candidates are for 2020. We're likely going to be voting for either Donald Trump or um, Biden. There are two ways this could play out. Um, you might think, well, they're both really shitty, um, but one or the other is less shitty than the other. If we take um, Brennan's definition of voting badly, um, even though we know that both of these candidates might be likely to enact harmful or unjust policies, we might be justified um, in voting for the lesser of two evils. So even though we're voting for a bad candidate, it might not be an instance of bad voting. Similarly, maybe you think that neither of these candidates are great, but neither of them are terrible. So um, if you have good reason, if experts say that both options are un unlikely to enact harmful or unjust policies, then perhaps you can cast a vote for either and still have it count as good voting. Uh, this might not work with these two particular candidates, but imagine we were voting um, between, say, Mother Teresa and Gandhi, something like that. I know that there are critiques of both of them, but we're going to ignore that and we're just going to pretend that they're both genuinely good people. Um, in that way, you might think that neither is a terrible vote, in which case voting for either might be an instance of voting well. Okay, 
So what Brennan means by voting badly is this quote that I've listed here under number two. So bad voting occurs when a citizen votes without sufficient reason for harmful or unjust policies or for candidates that are likely to enact harmful or unjust policies. The most common forms of bad voting that he lists are voting from immoral beliefs. So he gives the example of Alex the racist. Alex the racist votes for a policy because he thinks that it will harm African Americans. Um, voting in that way um, would count as voting badly because it's likely um, to produce harmful or unjust policies without sufficient reason. He's holding um, that immoral beliefs do not give you sufficient reason. Um, we can talk about this, maybe you disagree, um, but Brennan is holding that immoral beliefs do not give you sufficient reason for voting for a bad policy or a bad candidate. Um, bad voting might also take the form of voting out of ignorance. So we have the example of Bob. Bob has done no research into the policies that he'll be voting for. Um, so he goes in and just picks willy-nilly. Um, this is an example of bad voting because he doesn't have sufficient reason um, for voting as he does. There's an interesting footnote that Brennan goes into for this example that says we might have what's called the miracle of aggregation. So if people who are completely ignorant of the policies all go in and vote randomly, those random votes might cancel each other out. However, this footnote, it's footnote six on page 538 for anyone who wants to look into it, is that we have reason to think that the miracle of aggregation would not occur when people are voting out of ignorance, given that we have some empirical studies to show that voters who vote um, supposedly randomly will likely vote for a specific policy. So maybe the first policy listed um, or one with misleading names, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the supposed miracle of aggregation does not excuse voting for ignorance because we have reason to doubt that it would actually happen. Lastly, the last common form of bad voting um, is voting from epistemic irrationality or, or bias. Um, for this form, he gives the example of Candace. Candace has noble goals. She wants what's best for the country. But because she formed beliefs about what is best for the country um, via an unreliable or biased process, um, she might have formed beliefs incorrect beliefs about what actually is the best. So if she, for example, only relies on um, bad sources to get her information or completely ignores experts and only listens to maybe Aunt Linda to form her beliefs, she might think she's justified in voting for a specific policy um, when in fact she isn't because although she has done some, some research, she has done bad research. So um, these are the three most common forms of bad voting according to Brennan. So voting um, based on immoral beliefs, ignorance, or epistemic irrationality or bias. Okay, so this settles his second premise, um, or well, it doesn't settle it, but it sets us up to understand his second premise, which if you'll remember, is that voting badly is to engage in a collectively harmful activity. Um, we now know what voting badly is. So now we have to decide if voting badly um, is engaging in a collectively harmful activity and if we have an obligation not to engage in these activities. So 
he goes on to explain why he thinks we have a duty to refrain from what he calls collective harms or engaging in collectively harmful activities. So, according to Brennan, a collectively harmful activity is an activity that is harmful when many people engage in it, though it might not be harmful or is negligibly harmful when only a few people engage in it. He thinks that bad boating is an example, but we can think of another example being maybe driving a car that pollutes. So, this is me. Um, I'm driving to the beach, and you'll notice that my car is spitting out um, nasty pollution. If it's just me engaging in that action, I'm unlikely to contribute harm to the environment in any sort of significant way. However, when everyone is also um, driving a car that's spitting out nasty pollution, we wind up in a situation where um, we get a dangerous amount of pollution. So driving a polluting car is an example of a collectively harmful activity. He is going to argue that voting badly is also a collectively harmful activity. So to give you reason to think that voting badly is a collectively harmful activity, um, he argues that um, Oh, sorry, I lost my notes. Hold on. Okay, so he thinks that voting badly is a collective harm because when one individual votes um, from ignorance, from immoral beliefs, or from epistemic irrationality, it's unlikely to affect um, the outcome of an election. However, when multiple people vote badly, so um, from ignorance, from immoral beliefs, or from epistemic rationality, then we wind up in instances where the outcome of the election is affected by voting without sufficient reason. We can get immoral policies or unjust politicians when it happens, and he calls this polluting the polls. So in a way that my my driving a polluting car isn't causing much harm, but when all of us drive polluting cars, we wind up harming the environment. He says that when one individual votes badly, it's unlikely to make a difference, but multiple people engaging in the activity, it, it's likely to sway the results of an election. Um, and that this is harmful. Okay, so the question that we have to ask then is what does morality require of us when it comes to collective harms? When we are dealing with collective, collectively harmful activities or collectively um, harmful problems, does morality demand that we solve the problem as an individual? Brennan argues that this is too demanding. If I, as an individual, um, am not creating the whole problem, it's unlikely that I could, on the other hand, solve the problem by myself. I, by stopping driving, cannot stop everyone else from driving, so it's impossible for me to solve the problem of pollution, um, so morality can't demand that I solve that problem. But it might demand something weaker of us. Brennan argues that when it comes to collectively harmful activities, morality demands that we at least not be a part of the problem when there is little personal cost to refrain from engaging in the activity. Um, so when um, we think that... Yeah, I'm just going to start that one over. Um, so going back to pollution, it might wind up something like this. We um, 
all of us driving cars should not pollute because it is harmful to everyone, but I, as an individual car driver, should not pollute because it is unfair that I benefit from polluting as I please while others suffer the burdens of polluting less. So if everyone else agrees to um, stop driving or drive less, but I continue doing it um, as I wish, then I'm getting the benefits of less pollution without sharing any of the burdens, we might think that that is unfair. Um, therefore, we should share the burdens of not polluting. So um, with pollution being a collectively harmful activity, we would share the burden of reducing that. And I, as an individual, have a duty to not be a part of the problem so long as I'm not um, taking on too much personal cost. Similarly, when we talk about bad voting, we might say that we bad voters should not vote badly because it is harmful to everyone living in a democracy, but I, the individual bad voter, should not vote badly because it is unfair that I benefit from polluting democracy as I please while others suffer the burdens of polluting democracy less. Therefore, we should share the burdens of not polluting the polls. Therefore, what he's trying to say here is that I don't have a problem, I don't have a duty to fix the problem of everyone um, voting badly, but I do have a responsibility to not contribute to the problem. So it would be unfair for me to demand that everyone else not vote badly while I continue to vote badly. Voting badly um, collectively is harmful. Therefore, um, since I accept some principle of fairness, I should refrain from voting badly um, so I don't contribute to the problem or expect others to share um, disproportionate burdens. He ends this section by saying that the benefits of bad voting are outweighed by the duty to refrain from polluting the polls. He says that we might need some empirical studies to confirm this claim, but we have reason to think it's true. We can think of the benefits of bad voting being um, that I feel good about voting, that I feel like I'm contributing to democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Or we might even say that um, it contributes to greater voter turnout. But he thinks that we would need empirical studies to confirm at least this last claim, um, and that the d duty to refrain from polluting the polls um, outweighs this because when we collectively vote badly, we wind up with worse policies, worse politicians, um, and that harms everyone. Similarly, we might think that, well, that just suggests that we shouldn't use democracy, but Brennan says, we know that democracy performs better even with low voter um, participation than other forms of government like oligarchy. Um, so we should think that democracy, even with low voter participation, um, is better than anything else we can have. So as an individual, we have a duty to refrain from um, voting badly because um, fairness demands that we not contribute to collectively harmful problems. Okay, you might be thinking at this point, well, Brennan's just been arguing that we have a duty to not vote badly, but why don't we just have a duty to vote well? Maybe everyone has a duty to educate themselves, um, and participate in the polls to ensure that we absolutely bring about the best consequence. So you might have a question, why do we have a duty to not vote badly? This is a negative duty, um, a duty that can be satisfied by not doing something, instead of a duty to vote well. This is a positive duty, a duty that requires action. If good governance is a public good, don't we all have a duty to contribute to it? Brennan agrees that good governance is a public good, but he doesn't think that the reasons he's given to not vote badly 
are sufficient reasons to vote well. So he doesn't here refute all arguments um, for, for the positive duty, so he doesn't um, completely knock down or um, say that there might not be um, a good argument that we have a duty to vote well, only that his argument doesn't commit him to saying we have such a duty. Um, in other words, his reasoning and the argument as we've laid it out isn't sufficient to say that we have a duty to vote well, even if we have a duty to not vote badly. He gives us reasons um, to think that the duty to not vote badly aren't sufficient reasons to ground a duty to vote well. First, he says it's really hard to vote well. Um, you have to become educated, not only about the policies as they are, but about economics, um, maybe some political philosophy, um, probably some statistics, in order to be able to judge the merits of prospective policies that candidates are putting out. And this is very time consuming. We might have opportunity costs. This might take away from family time um, or time at a job that you might need to earn income to um, feed for yourself, feed yourself and your family. Um, these opportunity costs may not be justified. Second, we can contribute to social welfare in other ways. So for example, um, he says that this might take the form of working productively, fighting in just wars, or participating in culture or counterculture. So if we think that benefiting from good governance um, incurs upon us a debt that we have to pay to the public good in order to justify our benefiting from that, he thinks that there are many different ways we can pay this public debt. Um, so voting well isn't the only way to satisfy this duty we have to the public. Um, and lastly, he says that a liberal democracy allows us to not participate in politics. So even though um, we think that we might have a duty not to harm um, democracy. Li part of what's good about living in a democracy is that it allows us to live multiple different lives. If that life you want to live is a duty that prevents you, I mean, is a life that prevents you from engaging in politics, you ought to be allowed to pursue that sort of life. Okay, so he thinks that his argument um, provides us reason to think that we have a duty um, not to vote badly, but he doesn't think his argument gives us reason to think that we have a duty to vote well. But maybe you're feeling iffy. Maybe at this point you're like, well, isn't this a type of elitism? It seems like only certain people are going to um, morally be allowed to vote. Brennan agrees. He says, yes, I am arguing for a type of elitism. Um, <clears throat> however, he thinks that there are good examples of elitism and bad types of elitism. If he was saying something like, um, um, only the rich ought to be allowed to vote, he thinks that this would be a bad type of elitism. This would be unacceptable to most people. But there are good forms of elitism, according to Brennan. Um, for example, we might think um, that someone with shaking hands, shaky hands, shouldn't become a surgeon. That's a type of elitism, but we think it's acceptable. Similarly, he thinks that his type of elitism is acceptable because he's not advocating for anything that's legally enforceable. So again, we need to distinguish between the claim you have a political right to vote and the claim it is morally right for you to vote. He is not I'm just going to read a quote because I think it captures this point well. My position is not that the good voters should rule by right or that the bad voters are by right forbidden from ruling. Rather, bad voters should exercise their equal right to rule in the way that is most advantageous to themselves and others by abstaining from politics. 
So what he's saying is that he thinks um, that abstaining from voting should be a choice. It shouldn't be um, taken away as a legal right, um, but that we can still say that there's a morally right way to act. So, as he says, I advocate morally compulsory but politically voluntary abstention by potential bad voters. That is, people should not vote badly, but no one should force them not to vote badly. Lastly, he says that abstaining from voting is not the same as a loss of power. So, even when bad voters abstain from voting, they're still retaining all of their power in a democratic society. Um, and in fact, abstaining from voting may even be a way of voting indirectly. Um, to, to highlight why this might be the case, we can think about choosing where to eat. Imagine that I'm in a group of friends and we really want Mexican food. I'm like really craving a burrito, but I just moved to the area, whereas all of my friends have lived there for many years. I know that they know better than me what the good Mexican places are. Um, so I might abstain from voting which restaurant to go to because I know that the others in the group know better than me which restaurants are best. Um, in this way, I haven't given up my vote or my power, but I'm willingly letting others decide because I know that they'll be able to make a better decision without my input. It would be wrong for them to force me to go to any particular restaurant, but I'm not losing my power by saying I'm willing to go where you say is best because I don't know. So um, to end with this quote by him for this section, he says, some might see abstention as a violation of autonomy, perhaps even slave-like, but this seems mistaken. So long as I have an equal right to vote, choosing not to vote can be an autonomous act, a way of expressing my will that the best outcome be achieved. Since I retain a right to vote, I am an equal citizen and the democratic decision-making procedure remains generally acceptable. So this is why he thinks that his argument, um, while elitist, is not a bad version of elitism. One objection that he, he addresses is that, well, some people vote for, for character and not for policies. So um, we might think that voters vote for candidates who are honest, who are kind, um, who are compassionate, who are direct, et cetera, et cetera, um, instead of voting for specific policies. Similarly, we might think that people vote for uh, political experience or political expertise um, as opposed to voting for specific policies. Brennan's response to this objection is that voting for policies is the only way to ensure you're voting well. He says policies are what affect us. Just as an honest surgeon can be a bad surgeon, an honest politician can be a bad politician. Um, so he holds that voting for policies is the only way of voting well, and voting for character or political expertise are common, um, but it are still examples of voting badly. Um, if you want more on his explanation of this, he goes into detail on page 546. Um, he says, um, character-based voting might actually be the most common form of bad voting because to a significant degree, voting for character is voting for the wrong reasons. Um, politicians tend to take votes as mandates even when they shouldn't. They tend to try to enact the policies they favor, except at the extremes, character is not a reliable guide to political leadership. 
Um, a virtuous politician with a powerful sense of justice might still be deeply misguided and committed to all sorts of counterproductive harmful policies. Having the right values is not sufficient for making good policy because it requires social scientific knowledge to know whether any given set of policies is likely to achieve those values. If there is good evidence that a politician is likely to enact harmful policies, one should not vote for her without sufficient reason, even if she is a good person. Voting on the moral virtue of a candidate counts as good voting only when the candidate's moral virtue is evidence that she will not enact harmful policies. We're going to talk more about this objection when we talk about the Nico Kolodny article. Um, this is how people vote. Um, he is specifically addressing the merits of voting for character or perhaps on behalf of identity um, when it comes to voting and addresses Brennan's assumption that voting for policy or maybe not assumption he does provide some reason to believe it Brennan's assertion that voting for policies is the only way of voting well okay maybe you're convinced that bad voters ought not um, ought not to vote but Maybe you're unconvinced that people who are bad voters are going to recognize themselves as bad voters. You might imagine a bad voter saying something like this. Yeah, I agree bad voters shouldn't vote. Good thing I'm a good voter. For example, here we have Harold the bad voter. Harold um, is sure that he has done appropriate research. He's sure that he doesn't hold any harmful or at least unjustified beliefs. But in fact, Harold um, is implicitly sexist. Um, his sources are tainted. Um, he doesn't agree with the experts in any sort of justifiable way, etc, etc. But Harold is convinced that he doesn't fall under bad, under the category bad voter. The point I'm trying to make here and that Brennan addresses is that we are not good at knowing whether or not we have good reason for supporting something, whether it be a policy or a politician. It might be exceptionally hard or even impossible to recognize ourselves as bad voters. So if that's the case, it seems like Brennan's argument doesn't give us a good way of moving forward because people are unlikely to categorize themselves as bad voters. What Brennan says is that his argument can be true even if it doesn't provide us with a guide for how to act. So even if it's unlikely to be the case that his argument um, changes any particular individual's actions, it still could be the case that bad voters ought not to vote. We also might think um, that even if we aren't perfect at knowing if we're a bad voter, if we accept Brennan's argument, we might take actions um, to make it less likely to be the case that we're a bad voter. Um, this is at least going to um, capture the person who is voting with no knowledge of the policies or the candidates. So if I know that I am uneducated about a specific policy vote, I might choose to abstain or choose to do my research to ensure that I am more educated before casting a vote. So to recap, Brandon's, Brandon's argument is as follows. Premise one. One has an obligation not to engage in collectively harmful activities when refraining from such activities does not impose significant personal costs. Premise two, voting badly is to engage in a collectively harmful activity while abstaining imposes low personal costs. This gets him to the conclusion, therefore, one should not vote badly where voting badly means voting without sufficient reason for harmful or unjust policies or candidates. I'm going to start um, or end this lecture and start 
um, your thought process as we begin thinking about the next article by raising some objections to Brennan's, um, Brennan's argument. So first, we might ask, does Brennan assume that we live in a just society? So he seems to assume that abstaining um, or large amounts of people abstaining will not cause significant harm um, because he seems to think that other people or educated people will in general vote well. This ties into my second question. Does Brennan assume that education will always lead people to good policies? So when we provide people um, with education about statistics, economics, um, political philosophy, et cetera, et cetera, um, he seems to think that this will lead us all to um, voting against unjust um, or immoral policies. But it doesn't seem like he gives us reason to think that. It seems like he assumes that, and I'm unsure if he defends that assumption well. Secondly, or thirdly, I guess, the first two are kind of tied together um, in important ways. But the third objection, does he adequately defend the position that voting for policies is the only way to vote well? This is the question that leads into the Nico Kolodny article. Um, so I'm going to talk about that more in the next lecture. And lastly, should we be concerned that the group of people who have the opportunity to quote, vote well by Brennan's standards, does not seem to adequately represent the population. So if we think that educating yourself about policies and um, candidates is time consuming and requires access to um, materials that aren't freely accessible, it seems like we're going to cut out um, individuals of low economic um, status, those who have who don't have the time or economic resources to engage um, in educating themselves about policies and candidates um, because they're working multiple jobs or don't have access to um, good sources. Um, this is also going to cut across other demographics, right? So we know that people of color are less likely to have um, access to um, disposable income um, than white people, at least in America. Um, we also know that women are often burdened um, with child care duties that men aren't burdened with, so they may have less time um, or energy to engage um, in research, et cetera, et cetera. Should we be worried that the duty to not vote without educating yourself um, and educating yourself well might restrict voting well to a particular demographic? If it does, should we be concerned about that? Okay, so I'm going to talk more about these objections um, in my next lecture. So that'll be posted either tomorrow or on Wednesday. Um, I also hope that you will discuss some of these objections on the discussion board. Um, until then, make sure you read the Claudney article if you haven't already and be on the lookout for... Um, for the next lecture. All right, have a great rest of your Monday, and I will, you will hear my voice, and I will read your typed discussion um, soon. Okay, bye.